Gaza. The United States has given how much money to Israel? For how many years? So that's times how many years? And that's just, now one of the reasons, yeah, that's just what you see, is what I'm getting ready to say. That's one of the other reasons that I had to go. Well, first thing is that what you all never saw was that there was constant combat because I never signed the pledge. In 1992, I didn't sign the pledge. I could easily have signed the pledge in 1994. But I never signed the pledge. Why am I going to sign a pledge to an interest? Is somebody in here in the, in, in the press? No. <laughs> Mm -hmm. no, he's with uh, Congressman Kucinich. Yeah, I see. <laughs> Why am I going to sign a pledge of loyalty to another country? Why would I do that? I'm not even a full American. <laughs> because, you know, I ain't included in that original constitution. I understand my place as an African American, you know, but you can't see my birth certificate. You can't even see my passport. <laughs> but all of that money, oh, and this is what I was going to say, I got into trouble, you see, because I made a mistake. Well, I mean, I've made lots of mistakes. Mm -hmm. But I made a mistake that pricked my conscience. I uh, rushed into the house chamber, looked up on the board, saw everything green. So I voted green too, which was yes. Yay. Later, I found out after a 78 or so year old man died throwing stones at the U.S. I can't remember now building in I can't remember where he was throwing stones. But the bill that I had voted on was Jerusalem is capital city of Israel. Wow. And at that point, I vowed that I would never run up there at the last minute, look at the board, vote green, and then come out as if nothing had happened. <laughs> I had made the vote, and that was all that counted. So I made a point to apologize to uh, Please pardon me, the woman, the Palestinian woman, so, um, who Anana. was. Hanan Hanan. Yes. Yeah. I apologize to her. And I said, I'll never do that again. <laughs> and I did. So oftentimes you would see the, there would be two. No votes, it would be me and Ron Paul. <laughs> uh, we were consistent no votes. When when people were particularly courageous, it might be six of us, no votes. But I served on the House International Relations Committee. And I was in the uh, Human Rights Subcommittee, which also has jurisdiction over the State Department. And it is that it was that subcommittee that produced the State Department authorization bill. So I called in, in keeping my word, I called in the uh, committee staff and the State Department. And I said, I want to go over the bill. Well, of course, that was revolutionary because nobody had ever done that. <laughs> I said, they said, what? 
I said, I want to go over. <coughs> and honestly, when you go over the bill, you can see the handiwork of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Mm -hmm. Very well. Because hidden in the nooks and crannies of the standing legislation are all kinds of goodies. Like, for example, you know, as taxpayer, finances, any Jew in the world who wants to relocate to Israel, there's a fund for that. That you pay for. And my question was, well, suppose the money isn't used. Then it stays there until it's used, and the next year they get another, I think it was $30 million. So, um, these little things, like, I don't know why the Congress votes on Jerusalem as capital city, because they've already got that in the law. And I learned things that no member of Congress is supposed to know, just because I read the legislation that I produced out of my committee. I didn't produce it because we were in the minority. But had we been in the majority, then it would have been my responsibility to produce that bill. And I was able to put stuff in the bill. And I began to put things in the bill for Africa. Well, anyway, so um, that's a little on Gaza. Um, Libya and NATO. NATO is an anachronism, in my opinion. And uh, the um, idea that we could have NATO bombing Afghanistan, Pakistan, Libya, where else are they? Yemen. Yemen. Uh, Somalia. I mean, and that's, that's where I'm going. My position is this, and there have been, my, my brother here asked the question at the previous meeting, when well, you're viewed as pro Qaddafi. Well, you know what? First of all, the NATO allies in Libya have done something unconscionable to me. They have invited foreign countries to come in and bomb their fellow countrymen. As many objections to U.S. policy as I have, I would never want a bomb to drop on anybody in this room. I would never want to bleed uranium. I have tasted depleted uranium in my mouth in Libya. I don't want generations to come to be affected because of the presence of and the, the uh, uh, contamination of the deep range. I don't want premature deaths from cancer because of depleted uranium. I would never ask that of anyone to do to my country. And just as I fought against Israeli bombing in Palestine, I fought against U.S. NATO bombing in Libya. It's the same thing. You talk about collective punishment in Palestine? Well, try on collective punishment in Libya. You talk about targeted assassination in Palestine? They're doing the same thing in Libya. If it's wrong in one place, it's wrong in the other place. And we have a responsibility to not only the rest of the world, we have a responsibility to ourselves. Who are we? What does this country stand for if we allow this to happen in our names? I agree with that group, not in my name. Never in my name will I allow this to happen. brings me to Syria. The last bulwark 
in my opinion, is Libya. If Libya falls, I guarantee you a clean break policy will break out. And those of you who have read that document by the Project for a New American Century know that Syria has long been on the list, and Syria will be next. You can expect depleted uranium. You can expect white phosphorus. You can expect helicopter gunships. And will the peace community in the United States be as bought off and confused on Syria as they are on Libya? That's right. Some things are very clear. And everybody in this room, I'm sure, celebrates the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But did you realize how lonely he was on April 4th, 1967? No, not 68, that's when they killed him. 1967, when he made the speech at the Riverside Church. And he left his friends in the Civil Rights Movement who told him to be quiet. He left his friends. And people have left me. People that I thought were my supporters who could see the same vision who could see the same standard of peace, the same standard of justice and dignity. They left me and denigrated me and derided me and vilified me because I have a consistent lie. I'm against war in any shape or form.